Thank you for coming tonight to this evening's program with Francis Buck. Um, tonight's program is part of the Network Against Human Trafficking's conference called the Iowa Conference on Human Trafficking. We developed this conference in coordination and collaboration with Iowa State University. Mr. Buck spoke earlier as a keynote speaker as part of the conference, and we are delighted to have him here to speak with us again this evening. And once again, I'd like to thank you for your participation and in learning more about the issue of modern day slavery. <clears throat> Tonight's event is sponsored by the Network Against Human Trafficking, the Gender and Relationships on Campus Club, the YWCA of Ames ISU, and the Committee on Lectures, which is funded by the GSB. Francis Buck was only seven years old when he and 10 other Sudanese children of the Dinka ethnic group were taken at gunpoint by Arab gunmen from the north. Forced into slavery, he spent 10 years enduring beatings and living on scraps from his captors' meals. His third attempt to escape was successful, but after reaching Khartoum, he was forced by police to work as a stable boy and later imprisoned for speaking out against the government. Book was eventually granted UN refugee status and came to the United States, where he joined the American anti-slavery group. He was the first Sudanese escaped slave to testify before the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations and has met with President Bush, Condoleezza Rice, <clears throat> Madeleine Albright, and other important leaders. His book, Escape from Slavery, is considered an important record of the experience of contemporary slavery. And actually, we are going to have a book signing with Francis following tonight's talk, so I encourage you to purchase a copy of his book and learn more about modern-day slavery. If any of you are interested also in becoming more active in this issue, please do contact me. My name is Teresa Downing. I'm an assistant professor of sociology here at ISU and also serve on the board for the Network Against Human Trafficking. Let's welcome Francis Book to our university. Give me some minute to readjust the mic. <laughs> well, seconds. <laughs> Good evening. It is such an honor and privilege to be here and to stand here again before you and to present to you um, the short version of my story and the story of my people, the victorious people. Uh, we recently become the world news state, the Republic of South Sudan become uh, the last born, I guess. And uh, we are so happy, and I'm sure you are too happy for us and happy to join you and to be recognized as the first class uh, that represent equally the men and women uh, uh, without uh, discriminating or labeling who is the first and who is the last. So I'm so happy and I'm so joyful to speak uh, to you and to also announce that to you that South Sudan in July 9, 2011, this year, had just became um, a country of its own after a long, long struggle. Um, and that is the part of my story and because of that struggle, and because of that long uh, liberation, uh, and what people just made it. So let me just um, recap on rethinking and re-acknowledging the coalitions, the group that has actually put this event together from this morning until this evening. Uh, I would like to acknowledge and thanks my friend, the person of whom I've been communicating with, from last week and a half, uh, and this is Professor um, Teresa. She's been so, so she worked tirelessly, and I hope this is a reward for you, for your hard work and the group uh, to have me here, and I hope tonight and this morning had actually changed and challenged 
each and every one of us. And not only to hear all these emotional stories, personal testimonies, including mine, but to challenge you and to ask yourself, what is good your freedom? If you don't use it to help others who are living a dream of freedom. And I'm sure many of you students, professor, community members who have come here, I know you've been working all day, studying all day, but you're still committed to be here. That commitment alone um, acknowledge and illustrate that you are caring for our human fellows, those who are not here with us and cannot be here with us even if you extended this invitation to attend tonight evening. They wouldn't have come. Some years ago, I can't remember exactly now, before I escaped, I used to lie awake at night and wonder every single night who will come and free me. This when I was still in bondage, and I'm sure even today or this evening, I was sitting in comfort and freedom. There are millions, men and women, and particularly young men and young women, who are against their will, forced, and made to become slaves, become a property of another man or woman. Today, themes I have read in every paper that I've seen uh, put together by the coalitions, the network against human trafficking, all of our human trafficking, the traffickers. I'm speaking as a victim to you so that you know I'm not an expert, and I'm an expert in my own of how I lived it for 10 years and how it feels like. And I think this is the detail that I wanted to a bit um, uh, share with you at this moment. Uh, once again, let me thank also the Iowa State University for allowing such um, an opportunity for me and for all of you to be here, and many other great speakers that I have heard all day long um, contributing to this uh, national and uh, citizenry obligations. I call it citizenry obligation because each one of us has what it takes to make a difference, and I think in one way or another, we are all making a difference. And uh, one thanks each and every one of you for being here. Uh, also, before I move on, I want to acknowledge the presence of my friends, the South Sudanese. If you are South Sudanese in here, your presence is highly um, appreciated. Um, I know one of my friends, Andrew, who also was student here and graduated from Iowa State uh, not too long ago, a year ago. Is here, um, Andrew. Thanks for being here. Um, I also remember uh, one of the students I met when I just came in uh, two nights ago. Grang, I don't know if he's here. Yeah, there you are. Thanks for being here. Um, these are South Sudanese. These are the future leaders. And by the way, you can, you will be surprised. I'm named Grang. The one of the leader, the giant, one of the blob of sun and the hero, Dr. John Grang was one student here at Iowa State. He did his doctorate at Iowa State University here. I can't remember exactly the year. And because of what you invest on him, he has led us during the darkest days. Because of the skill and education he acquired in this community, he negotiated on his best ability to bring peace even though he's not here with us today to enjoy the fruit of what he has actually worked tirelessly from the last 20 plus year of civil war, a chairman commander of the SPLA, Sudan People Liberation Army, and the chairman of the SPLM, Sudan People Liberation Movement, now is the ruling party at the New Republic, South Sudan. Dr. John was here. He always talk about this, and I remember his last speech before he dies actually on the helicopter crash on July 30th, 2005, was here. He gave his speech here, I'm sure. Not on the same podium where I'm standing, but I'm sure somewhere within the Iowa State uh, University. So we are thankful we have incredible relationship with you, and that's why I accepted the invitation to come here and participate 
uh, on this event, um, taking me two days to travel from Juba to here. Juba, the capital of the New Republic, of course, South Sudan. But ladies and gentlemen, this challenging, I don't know how much you read or heard about 27 plus. I heard some experts from law enforcement, legal background, victims, and I also did participate in a number of symposiums and uh, human trafficking conferences in the United States and Canada. And I feel that we actually listen much than doing um, much. And I challenge us, starting from us, owner citizens, we do not actually do our part to our best level, and that is to speak up, to make yourself. You don't have to have lots of money or be a great speaker in order to make a difference. Who am I to stand before you and actually speak to you and to ask you what you should do? Ish and Ibn Abbas, that's what it takes to make a difference. Human trafficking, slavery, genocide, all these things are all together. They happen for reasons. I remember I was seven years old. First time I heard my parents talking about, when I hear name Arabs, this just to say it's simple, what I heard in that time. I heard something Arabs, and then Arab Murahaleen, Bagar. Maybe the same people that uh, today call ginger wheat, if you are familiar with the western, um, western part of Sudan, the old Sudan, uh, where the trouble still actually um, going on, and of course it's going on even in Uba Mountains. It's going on even in southern Blue Nile. It is going on as well as far as Nubians, those who are boarding Egypt, and of course um, in Bija and Eastern Sudan. When I heard my parents, I never experienced and never seen these people until one of the evening of 1986. I was a seven years old boy. Young kids always tend not to listen on the important thing that adults are talking unless your parents grab you and say, you have to listen to this if there's something important to you. And I remember that evening, my mother did not actually send me to local markets for any bad intention. But I believe that's the reason I survived and being here today and speaking to you as a victim and a survival, because I call my, I'm a survival. Because both my parents, none of, none of them actually survived after I left my village. I remember I was playing underneath a mango tree with my friends, and because kids in South Sudan, unlike kids in Iowa, or in Ames here, or elsewhere, kids in South Sudan then, and still is now a challenge, have no many chores to do. They just play. They have no schools. And every morning we woke up and we sit underneath the tree. Our big brother helped us by bringing mud. We actually make cows. Boys in particular, girls does some other things that are more relevant to women or females. And we make cows because we are the cattle people. We love cows. We just like people of Texas. We, we love cows. <laughs> and uh, this determined actually um, when you were 15 in my culture, in Dinka culture, and I believe in other tribes such as Nuer, uh, it is very important that you, at that age, before you began to date any girl, you have at least some cows and you work hard because marriage is not free. You had to pay a dollar, and that actually uh, increased a lot of cows. So we make cows and we compete, determine, you know. How much cow you will have, or how many cows, excuse me, you will have one day. And I used to compete every single day, and I always cheat my friends. I asked my brother at night to make me extra cows until I mastered to do them, make them fast by myself. 
that day when my mother came to me and asked me to go to a local market in Yomlel to sell eggs and peanuts, the competition was very high. All my friends were ready to compete that day. And they said, today we will defeat you. We will never leave you leading. It has to be someone else. And I told them, no, you win. But unfortunately, that day, our competition was interrupted because my mother asked me to go to local market. And there was a first day to send me alone with a kid from the neighbor. However, from that evening, from last hug I had from my mother and my two siblings, I never returned back home. And I never seen them, and I will never see them again. My mother and my father and both my two sisters were actually murdered with many other families, community members. The Arab Bagara had actually came to my village and stormed the village. And they decide whether to kidnap and people resist. Actually, they burn them alive. My parents were burned alive along with other people. The same group of men on the horseback and camels had marched to the marketplace. I remember after we arrived to the marketplace, people were talking, particular adults were pointing towards our village. Some were saying they heard a gun shooting, gunshot, and some were saying they saw smoke. But I was not actually aware of any danger or anything that may happen. But the movie I watched that day, and I, I believe some of you because you are so care, it seemed to me. You might have watched this movie. If you haven't, you should watch it because I was in the same movie when I was seven years old in 1986. Have you ever watched the Wate Rwanda movie? I was in the same movie. I watched men and women, including kids, were brutally killed around me. I watched blood running like water in a small river. I watched and I seen Many men, I couldn't even count, lie on the ground like people who just decide to relax, but they were dead bodies. I was horrified, horrifically horrified. I was saying, what is this? We come here for business. Why does this market tend to be like this? And who are these people? Because this man, this madman, including the man who became my master for the next 10 years, Juma Abdullah, were killing our fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers. They all have machine guns and they have swords. And they were just randomly killing. And of course, kidnapping, and also stealing our livestock. And it took many of us, young men and women, and the men in particular, they, take, they don't take them, they kill them because the men are threat. They only abandon the elderly women that cannot perform. When I say perform, they cannot physically maybe be able to do the the work that they wanted them to do when they bring them to their communities. But the physical ones and the young children, they're the one actually being kidnapped. I witnessed a 12 years old girl being shot on the head because she cried that she actually seen her mother and father was shot in front of her. And one of militia men told her to stop and she couldn't stop crying. And she was actually pulled out of group and was shot on the head to demonstrate to any kid that may resist and try to run away. I knew we were actually in trouble and somewhat 
taken by the wrong and strange people that I never seen, strange people that do not share anything in value. They don't look like me. They don't they speak different language. They speak Arabic, and I only speak Dinka. That's my native language. I had to learn Arabic later in a hard way because I have to learn it in order to communicate. I remember we were divided like products. After we arrived to the farms, all the kids were kidnapped were divided, and I ended up living with a man called Jima Abdullah. I remember when I first arrived at Jima Farm, he called the whole family to greet me. And the kids actually ran towards me, shouting, a beat, a beat, and a beat me in black slave. And, and I was so shocked how even the children have already been oriented and brainwashed and isolating themselves from me. They only come near me when they are coming to amuse themselves by spitting on my face or peeing on me or anything that would entertain them. And I remember my master's wife, her name's Hawa, who hated me always. She has the rules. And obviously, it has been Ten good years, we never have eye contact until one day I did intentionally to see her reaction, what she will do. Because she always tell me, if, she's, if I'm coming to pick up my food, she would tell me to look down but not having an eye contact. And one day I did, and she would tell me, don't move your head, stand there, and stop there. And she called one of her son to come and spit in my face and gave him a stick to beat me. And I was saying to myself, what is such a horrible woman? Why she hated me? And of course, her husband, I wouldn't say he likes me because he would have treated me the way he treated his sons and other kids. But he likes me to take care of his cattle because I was a hard-working person. I was the first one to work up in the morning, and the last one to go to bed. That was my life routine with these people. The job that I do, I never heard a word from my master, Jima, appreciating, thanking me, or acknowledging the dedication of what I do daily. In opposite, I'm always beaten. And I cannot ask a question I cannot say no, even when it's absolutely big no. I was only taught and oriented to say one thing, and that is yes. Yes for everything and anything. And I felt that I was not human enough, I guess. What was, what was wrong with me? Why are these people dehumanizing me in a such a manner? Why they treated me the way they treated me? I promised myself that one day I will ask my master three questions, and indeed I did. This is after I learned the broken Arabic. One of the evening, my master was passing by me. That he always insisted too to call him abui in Arabic, mean a father, and I refused to call him a father because he's not a father. I asked him, Juma, why? You called me a beat, black slave. And why you forced me to sleep with the animals? And why nobody loves me? It took him less than a minute to walk back and grab his favorite stick that he always beat me with. He beat me actually severely. And he told me, don't ever again ask me these questions. I apologized to him because I knew he was serious and wanted to kill me. In fact, there's nothing can prevent him from killing me, should he choose to. But I believe God was there with me. 
who was watching and guiding me. And till two days later, he came to me and said, the reason we call you a beat and black, and, uh, black slave and force you to sleep with the animals is because you are an animal. He said this to me. From that day on, I was hurt inside. I said, I'm not an animal. I cried and I said, I'm not an animal. How could he say that? I began to work harder even than before, but my plan was to skip. It was, that, was not actually an easy task for me to skip first time without knowing my way and where to run and who to run to for help. But I did try the first one and I failed. Despite that I was not able to make it the first time, I was also hurt because after that my master took me to our neighbor's home. Muhammad. Muhammad is actually the owner of the, he's the richest guy um, in the area with the camels. He has a lot of camels. And the boy who was actually herding these camels, he's a Dinka boy, his name but joke, but joke. He was captured with me in one of the village, called, my village called Masharadut. I remember the boy very well. We were taken the same day. But Juk was sick one of the day, and his master forced him to attend the camels, and he told him that I can't. He was forced, so he took them to the forest nearby, and he returned home early before his actual time that he usually bring the camels home. So when he arrived early before the camels, his master said, you are lazy, and I will make you stay home. So the boy was tortured. They cut off one his left leg and one his arm, emboldening him. And I was, my master took me to that house after my first attempt to scare me. So when we got to Muhammad home, he told me, go to your cousin. They call us cousin, go to talk to your cousin in your language. So I was talking to Burjok in Dinka, and I started crying right away. He was warning me. Please never say no. If you can ask me today the fate of a joke, I will tell you I don't know. Because I was lucky to skip after multiple attempts. I successfully made it that time. But I don't know the fate of a joke, and I don't know the fate of many other hundreds of thousands of kids. I'm talking about the boys here, and I have not even yet talked about the women, the young girls. And that's why I think the theme of today's event is so important. Because you're talking about human trafficking, you're talking about prostitutes, you're talking about many other things that involved. And this is what these young women, and I've seen it in my own eyes. But who speak? On their behalf, nobody. I hope one day you will have an opportunity to hear from one of the victims who were captured also in the same time, the same year. The South Sudanese, who is a mother of four children today, live in the state of Massachusetts, where I live in Boston. Her name is Abuk Bak. She was captured and she was actually being used during her 10 years in captivity as well. She speaks out about her experiences the experiences of the girls, what kind of jobs they do. So this is, this, this is something that I blame our government. Could it be the United States government, or could it be even my new republic government? This is something that should be a priority. They should be talking about this every day and should not be hyped. It should be in the front page of every magazine, newspaper, articles. This is an issue of women, um, human fellows who are being denied and being treated less than animals. 
I'm speaking from the experience because some time back somebody asked me during my, one of my presentations like this, how did you survive 10 years in captivity? How do you feel like every day? And I, and I said, I wish I had a video of myself during this long 10 years in captivity. I think we'll best speak to you directly. I remember when I first started to speak out, I used to cry during the period of my presentation because it's not actually, I don't enjoy retelling this story. I only really enjoy it because I want to make a difference. I want it to stop from me, but not to happen to you or to anyone or your siblings. I know this thing happened then and could still happen even as we speak. It is happening as of course. But we do very little. Our government does not act. I remember when I first met with Secretary, the former Secretary of State, Melvin Albright, in 2000 at the U.S. State Department. I asked her if she knew about slavery in Sudan and genocide in Sudan and Mauritania and some other countries. She said yes, but we are too busy now with, uh, there was a war going on in Sierra Leone, in Western Africa. And I think I was having somebody who was helping me. My, uh, that time in 2000, I don't speak English, so I said, what did she say? She said, they're busy where? Sierra Leone? Said yes. She said, where they are? They said, somewhere in Africa. There's a civil war. Said, well, but this is a problem too. Can she just acknowledge it? This is happening and it's the wrong thing. And can't be stopped. Um, and I was disappointed, but I did not give up. I did not. I, the same day, I met with other leaders. The following year, I was able to meet with other sector of state, Candidate Rice, and met with another Secretary of State, Colin Powell. Each of them, when I shook hand with them, I don't release the hand. I said, no. Until you say to me, you are going to act. Now, but not tomorrow. Each of them vow yes. Of course, they play their role, and I appreciate that. The same thing I did to the President of the United States, George W. Bush, when I met him first time. When he actually sent the former Senator from the State of Missouri, John Danforth, as his special envoy to Sudan. I was actually among 30 Congress, I remember, I only saw Sudanese sitting there. I heard him speaking and John Dent was speaking. Soon after that, I ran to him. I shook hands with the president. I said, President, you always say you do what you say. So please mean it. Help bring peace in my country. Please liberate my people. They have been suppressed and oppressed and marginalized for so long. Sudan gained it, it's independent from Great Britain in 1956, but that independence was meant only for the northern brothers and sisters, but not us. I don't think in my, I was born in 1979, and I happened to enjoy freedom and be a free man. First time when I actually arrived to this country in late of 1999. That's when I stressed my arms very high. That's when I took a big deep breath and I said, I'm a free man now. Because I knew USA is the freely nation. I knew nobody would use me like a tools. 
This is a tool. I can either turn opposite and not using it, this microphone. But you could never use a fellow human being like a tool. I was actually rented to go and work for some other powerful man, Arabs man, to go and work at his farm and herd his goats. And however that money I was actually being rent, I don't even know how much and how many cows. Whatever that I'm worth actually compensated to my master. Because I was his property. The same thing when you heard about the human traffickers. The traffickers are the people, obviously, who've been either tricked by the big businessmen or women with the promise they will come and send to school or have a job so they can support their poor families. And they end up being tricked and made to work for no pay under threat of violence, threatening them to be sent to police, arrested, or threatening them they would go and murder their families. This is what happening, and this is what happened to me too. I would threaten every day. And I do everything every day, even though I do not like what I do, in the name of survival, because I have a dream. Even as I stand here before you this evening, I have a dream. I want to be somebody someday. So I didn't want to die. And because, and this is something that I appreciate my father because I remember when I was a little boy, my father used to call me Mutiakro in my native language. Mutiakro means 12 men. And I asked him one of the day why he called me 12 men. He said that you always come with the new ideas, you always have dreams. You're always running around me even when he's working on his farm. In my culture, it's very hard to be close to your father when your father is actually chatting with some other, some, some other other people. Or even eating, you cannot come close by. But my father always invited me, only me. He has eight of us. We are four from my mother, two boys and girls, and four from my stepmother. It is illegal all way to have two wives, so don't be surprised. So, but my father made me number one child, and he always say that, I'm sure one day you will make a difference. And I think that what kept me going for 10 years, I would say to myself, I want to be somebody. I want to prove to my father that I could do something. I'm not doing yet, but I'm trying my best to do something. Like many of you are trying to do something that could contribute to this great society. So this has been my experiences, a little bit of what I have done here. When I came to this country, as I said, in late of 1999, as a refugee, resettled to Fargo, North Dakota, I asked myself exactly the same first question I asked you when I actually started talking. I said my freedom in this country, even though I'm going to enjoy every moment and every opportunity in the United States. What is good my freedom if my people are still dying? What is good my freedom if my people are still held in bondage? I promise myself that I hope one day when I'm able to speak English, I will speak out. I will start speaking out on behalf of my fellow human beings and people like Barjok. Indeed, when I actually complained about the weather after three months of my arrival to USA in Fargo, when I was tricked again, not even to uh, avoid the cold state, I was, this is my second home. And my second home, not just state of Iowa, but Ames. 
this is the first big university I've ever seen in my life since I came to USA is Ames Iowa State University because I was just on the same street Lingo Way. And Andrew actually were together at the time when I first moved here. My first jobs, two jobs, were here in um, Ames, Iowa. I was working at a meat company where the majority of South Sudan is almost 100% all of them working <laughs> at that uh, uh, meat uh, factory at Nevada, Iowa. I was working at night uh, sanitation uh, department and then I come straight from my work at 7 a.m. and go to Holiday Inn where I was working also full time as an housekeeping. I was working two jobs. I only have Sunday off, I remember. And that is to do my laundry and at least to visit people. And um, that's the only day I had. So this is my second home um, because I complained about the weather and I was tricked by my agency. I was sponsored by Luton Social Services and I, they had somebody from Iraq who speak Arabic whom after I complained about the weather, he mentioned three states and they, he asked me to pick one. And I missed the two good ones <laughs> in terms of the weather. Um, the first one in Phoenix, Arizona, and the other one was Houston, Texas. And I said, Iowa. Iowa was actually among the three. And the reason for Iowa was there was South Sudanese population already resettled here in Des Moines. So, and I was complaining about being lonely too. That's why Iowa was among the three, the other two. So I said Iowa, and I ended up being here in Ames <laughs> until five months later. I was uh, discovered by the human rights groups that based in Boston called the American Anti-Slavery Group. And they invited me to move to Massachusetts and work with them. And from that um, day on, I moved to Boston, and I become a part of anti-slavery group. Uh, and since then, that's where I began speaking out locally at middle school, high schools, and colleges, including at Harvard Kennedy School of Government, uh, where I held a panel, slavery in Sudan, and you name it, including Canada and somewhere in Europe. I've been traveling, including some other countries in Africa. I have never stopped speaking out because I said I'm a lucky man, and those who have no voice the voiceless needed you and I, and you and I could be their voice, and you and I could be their ear, and want to actually challenge our leaders. In South Sudan, the long struggle of people of South Sudan and other marginalized groups within the country of Sudan had able to achieve the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in 2005, under the leadership of the man that I mentioned to you early, our blubber brother in the year, Dr. John Grant. But that peace was American legacy. It was a legacy of people like you. I mobilized, I don't know how many, students from middle school to high school to colleges and universities across the US. I would tell them write a letter to your Congress, congressmen, congresswomen, talk to your leaders, religious leaders, your pastor, your rabbi, anybody in your community, your parents. You too collect some money and help get involved with any organizations they have. Call the White House. We rally outside, they supported us. I had protesters across everywhere. I had lobbied to every Congress men and women, senators. I all go to the offices, I tell them, I'm a victim of slavery, and it's still illegal in my country. Do you know about it? If yes, what are you doing to stop it? People in this country, I believe then, believed slavery ended after the civil rights movement over 200 years ago in 1865. That was true, yes. But slavery is not history. Slavery is still alive. 
is still alive and happening today. And that's why we cannot relax. We cannot say it's none of our business. It's not happening to our friends or people we know or no one never hurts. Whatever is matter in Africa, in Asia, you name it, should be matter here. In Ames, Iowa, should be matter here at Iowa State University. Should be matter to you as an individual, but it has a group. It bothered me when I actually read about the victims, how they've been tortured, how they've been trafficked to the Middle East for pleasure, for the people who have money, using them like tools. It hurt me. So the opportunity is here. It is you. It is you to stop it. So I invited you to join the fight by getting involved. You can enjoy the network, like the network again is human trafficking. There are many other wonderful organizations, including the UN, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International. I used to be not a fan of them, by the way. I'm not a fan of the UN. Did I mention UN first? No. I only appreciate the fact that the UN has granted me an opportunity to be in America. And that was the status, the refugee status that I got. But that's not the way to solve the problems. UN, when I actually had to take a test, over 100 or 100 questions in order to become naturalized in U.S. citizens, you have to pass those questions. Among those questions, there's a question about the UN. You have to define what is the United Nations. So does anybody know what the United Nations role is? I know you all know. But do they... Okay. What did they promise? Never again. Do you remember that? Okay. So how many times they vowed never again? and again, and again, and again, and again. In my own country, we have two genocidal. The first one, the over two million, has been murdered in South Sudan. Because my parents are the victim of that, and I'm the victim of child slavery. Another genocide is in Darfur, where a thousand dies a week. And again, it's happening at the UN Watch. So what did that promise all about? They're not doing enough. I did it, I said it, and I was actually able to challenge them. Kofi Hanan, when he was still there, I challenged him. I been invited to that tall building. And I never afraid, I always say it. I put I even protest against his speech as the the commencement um his speaker at graduation at Harvard University during graduation, I protest again as I mobilized students, majority of whom were from Harvard, Boston College, Boston University, Northeastern University, and many other schools local there. And all of our fellow South Sudanese men and women were out, and they supported me. I rejected his speech because he didn't deserve to come and speak there. He should have actually went to Darfur. When women, innocent women and children were dying, you name it from anything. There's a complete desert. There's no water, there's nothing. These people are dying every single day and they are still pleasing and because the, the UN Security Council has its member who have oil interest in my country. So we're China, Russia, and I was able also to be on the panelists with the people that I challenged, and I was so pleased that I was given an opportunity to ask them two questions. I remember one of whom was 
the former president of Soviet Union, Gorbachev, and also um, the other one was the man who indicted uh, President Omar Hassan Hamad al-Bashir, uh, Luis Moreno Ocampo. Uh, we were actually speaking at reconciliation, something reconciliation. Desmond Tutu was there, uh, Nobel Peace Prize from South Africa. And I was actually among them, the youngest one, and I said, can I speak first? Because I want to sit in the audience and ask these people. I have two people I want to ask questions. And those two people actually um, was uh, the former president of Soviet Union and also um, the head of the ICC, International Criminal Court. When I actually gave an opportunity, I asked Mr. Gorbachev, that if he's still the president of Russia today, what would have he done different to solve the, the problem of the Sudanese? Because every time the Security Council sits and have a resolution, they vote against it. And the Chinese. And because he is a politician and is one of the smartest guys, he asked my question, he went attacking USA talking about you were jumping there, and I remember the late Manut Ball, the former NBA, the tallest guy, seven foot seven, stood up, and everyone, every camera was turned on his way, and he said, Mr. President, please respond to this question. I become broke because I gave all my money away <laughs> because of that war. And your country has always been against any resolution bring the last of peace in Sudan. Um, and he still didn't, didn't make any difference. The other question was um, to Luis Moreno Cambo, how confident he was that Bashir would be captured after he got indicted, and by whom, and when. Those are the questions that I was asking because they were important for me and important for my people, and I think for the media as well. He didn't give any concrete answer, but he said he will be captured. And I'm sure Bashir will stay there until he dies. I'm sure he will never leave, because he's still violating. He's saying that a piece of anything. He's traveling wherever that he pleases to travel to, including even Kenya. So um, I just want to stop here, but once again to remind you, this is very important topic. If our fellow brothers and sisters are not free, unless we can never say we are free too. Part of me, I'm always doing everything as an individual to better my own living and everything, but always making sure that I'm doing my part. And that's why I'm here. And I hope that you will continue with your commitment to spread awareness, to be an ambassador, and to actually pressure your congressmen, congresswomen, and the president of the United States. South Sudan had just become a country, but there's a lot of challenges. Abia has been occupied by force May of this year. And just before the independence, it's a part of South Sudan territory. It's lived by nine Dinkangok, my tribe, but claimed by the Khartoum. Abia belonged to them because that's where the oil is. Sudan, by the way, one of the richest countries with natural resources, including the oil. And because of the oil, they are not interested in people. The nine Ngok Dinka, but they are interested with the resources in that area. Part of Unity State, one of the states that belong to the South. So until today, we have not reached the agreement on the, um, the border demarcations and also some other outstanding protocols, including uh, the three areas that I just talked about, and the uh, Nuba Mountain is still, and of course, Southern Blue Niles. These are our brothers and sisters who have actually fought along with us during the liberation. And we people of South Sudan cannot be free until they are too are free. Of course, Darfur and Western Sudan are still struggling. 
So these are the things that are still yet need your voice, need your commitment. Of course, the new sovereignty, the Republic of South Sudan, is facing a lot of challenges. It's one of the poorest countries today. And we need you. We need your experts. Come there, help us, teach us. Yes, you're preparing these leaders here, sitting among you. But we do need you. Help out with the schools, hospitals, roads, clean water. Everything is priority. There's nothing. I can give you lease of everything, endless lease. So send your investors. If you have small business that you need to invest, South Sudan is one of the safest places today. And also remember, South Sudan is going to be like state of Israel. It's going to be the only non-Muslim state that's surrounding by Some countries do not like us. We don't have to like them as well. We are open to who like us and want to be friend with us. We can be friend with you. If not, it's okay. But we know our allies are you, the U.S. and some others. So we need you also to be watching over and not forgetting. So that is what I want to mention to you, something that you really need to contribute to. And I encourage you also to support my foundation that aims to build schools. Um, I was aiming to break records in a few weeks, the second week of November, to begin with the school construction, a high school in my village in Gorion in South Sudan. But unfortunately, the funds has not been um, um, the what what needed to be started. Not even ten percent of it. So we are still hopeful. I'm not giving up on that. And you can support such initiative should you have what you can uh, offer. So at this moment, I would like to hear from you with any reaction of anything, comments, or I'm going back to that new republic in actually um, next four days. I was only coming here for six days for this conference and I'm going back. And I will always remind our people that we have good friends, indeed Americans, and I'm not claiming everyone sitting here is Americans, are our true friends. And again, I talk about the peace, the comprehensive peace agreement was a legacy of you, the American people. And do not take that privilege for granted. Continue to support us. Continue to be our mentor. So that is what I want to say. But at this juncture, um, I will encourage you to get involved with any organization that you know out there, or just go online. Or all the big names that I mentioned, human rights organization, including those of Amnesty and Human Rights Watch and what have you in the United Nations, um, they're doing something, I guess. But not, I'm not that big favor of them. I, they, they need to do even more to prove what they are founded for. And that is to stay in peace and to actually uh, stand with the people who need the most, like us now, in Nuba Mountain and Blue Night. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any question, please, there's no silly question, particularly I encourage the students, the question that you may not get the right answer from your teachers or professor, do ask the community members, everybody, you are welcome. And I appreciate also those who are contributing, uh, pressing my copy of my book, because what I just share you is just a short version of it, but more details, more stories are in that book, and I invited you for any question. And thank you so very much for being so committed and so kind. Spend all day. I'm not there. Most of you spend all day listening to all these great speakers. I did the same thing. I was going to room to another room. I want to hear what they are talking about. 
and how interested the people are. And I see everyone so interested listening. So thank you so very much for the opportunity to listen to me. Once again, I look forward to speaking to you once again in the near future, whether here or somewhere else. And I look forward to seeing some of you coming and even volunteer one day to teach at my school. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. Uh, we would like to take a few moments now to answer questions that you may have about Mr. Book's experience in S Sudan as South a child Sudan. slave mm -hmm. and now in South Sudan in his efforts to rebuild the country. You want to put that back? Sure. Any question? I will ask questions if nobody. Okay, there. Um, how did I make my third or the last attempt? How did I do it? It is um, more detailed, but I would just uh, give you a short answer to that. Um, the third term was actually a bit harder, but I was mature enough at the time. I was 17. This was in 1996, exactly the year that uh, the most wanted man which actually paid the price um, after long uh, Osama bin Laden left my country that time. That's the year I skipped, but I actually vowed to myself that I will not give up this time. If anybody caught me, I would resist, and that means anything. Either I make it or don't make it altogether. But because God, I was, and by the way, I use God always because I'm a Christian myself, but I believe in any religion that you believe in, and when you're in trouble, you turn your heart to God, God always guided you and delivered you. And I think God had been watching me all along and delivered me, and successfully I was able to skip my last attempt, running all day at the forest until I was actually helped, rescued by the loader driver or the truck driver, making my way to another nearby town called uh, Motari, and eventually uh, I was helped by one of the northern Sudanese Muslim men whom I call him a year in my book, his name Abdurrahman. Yes, he was Muslim, he was an Arab, but this man had a heart for other human fellow. He rescued me, he the one that paid. Um, yes, there are, they are not really concrete um, um, primaries or elementary school there, but they are somewhat studded under the trees and then there are those Ted Walsh standard schools, <laughs> but we consider them schools. Yes, they are, they are. But those kids who are teaching there are kids who actually only completed eighth grade. They are the teachers. I met 13 of them, and they said we, this is the, where they could go, that they hire, they <laughs> could go nobody else, and there's no secondary school, of course, they're stuck there. And this kid, the one that come in volunteer on teaching the other to stand with their own siblings to friends and 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 I was so challenged by how they are so determined and so willing to learn. And I, I told them that I know what it takes. And I know how important education is because education is a ticket to success. I told them that I struggled too when I came to this country. In fact, and I was sitting amongst all American, pure American kids who speak none other than English as a first language, native speaker. And I was in a high school with them in Massachusetts. They all asked me why, why I'm so tall and why, um, why I'm 20 and still in high school. 
I was compromised, and I always tell them, I wish one day I would tell these kids why. I didn't cheat myself. I didn't refuse not to go to school, but because I did not have a chance. The same thing happened to me when I went to Tufts University in Boston. I sit with a kid who said, how old are you? I said, I'm 30 years old. What are you doing here? Are you grads or doing PhD? I said, no, I'm doing... I'm actually pursuing my undergrad degree. What? Um, said, yes. It is a, actually, to them, it's surprising. But when I had time, I invited them one by one. And I sit with them and I tell them what happened. And they become more closer to me learning. And they say, wow, we can imagine what you have went through. And the commitment that you still have, and determination. So basically... Um, that kind of school is there, but high school it needed because I really wanted to invest on that because these kids could become strong leaders if we train them well. And also, I wanted that school to be used not only utilized by the kids, but adults. Adults also must be taught adult literacy and they have to value education. If they don't value education, they will never committed to their children and supporting them. Because I remember uh, one person from my clan who has a lot of goats and he has two daughters. And one in the sixth grade and the other one in the third grade. And they were struggling. They have no notebooks. And they were actually unable, the one in the sixth grade was not able to afford buying um, the book that cost 10 pounds, South Sudanese, I don't know, 10 pound equivalent to $3 or less. And she was backing her father if he could um, sail away one of the goats so she can buy that. And nobody, she was beaten. And she was actually introduced it to the husband. So the last time she talked to me, said, you know, my parents are interested in forcing me to early marriage because they want to make because um, this, this, I said, poor people does bad things always in the name of survival. Um, and last time I went, I couldn't ask, but I didn't see her. I'm sure she was very young. Uh, she was 13 at the time, and I'm sure now she's, um, she gave up that education. She's been forced early married to somebody that is maybe 50 years old or more. So this thing happening, and because of lack of education and lack of knowledge, so we, uh, I, I spend more time in the village just making, talking to these people in a very polite way, and not in a Western way of <laughs> life, but I tell them, it is important to allow your children. This is what benefit you and them. So I, and I actually did help them with the clean water, with the wells, hand pumps, I did that in almost every village that close to where my village is. And where the school is built, I have about 16 of them. So the kid could have clean water. Um, and um, that's how I started it. And now I tell them that I'm, and I ask them to make bricks for free. And I have thousands of bricks now sitting there because they're so exciting. They're so exciting, but it's been a long uh, waited uh, thing, and I was telling them uh, recently before I came here last week that I don't know, I'm not sure if we are going to start in November. So you have to be patient a little bit until the money are gone. Because it's very hard, the economy, I tell them that USA is where I used to raise money, but nobody willing to give money because they don't even have. They literally have the keeping them for themselves, and that is true. But not to tell them to keep, if you can give, please do so, because uh, this is very needed um, uh, thing. Uh, school is one of the most important things. Um, I'm not talking about, about the health facilities. There's no even a single health facility in my village, not even a single. I talked to the man who said he watched his wife dying, delivering um, twins, and she died. The twin and her, they all died together because nobody was well trained, there's no midwife, there's no, and it was in the raining seasons and flood and they couldn't take her anywhere because they have to carry you. Um, 
So these are the challenging things that are still happening today in my village and around the tennis state of South Sudan. But I want to begin, as always, chair begin at home. I want to start there and maybe reach out to others. Yes, ma'am. No, but somebody in Pennsylvania has asked me the same question and asked me to read. Uh, and now you have repeated again. <laughs> it would be a priority for me to read because I. Thank you. I will uh, certainly relate that to my own lives and my own struggle. Another hand. Okay. Um, I just want to uh, invite it back here. Um, the master ceremony and uh, of my friend, my dear friend. Uh, she said to come and close um, our uh, evening event, but I would be happy to autograph those of you who have a copy of my book there. But I wanted to say once again, the, the topic of today, um, as you hear from many speakers, you listen to many speakers, including my own speech, had actually enabled you um, to think of what you can do as individual or as a group. As you live here, uh, do not leave these stories here in this room, but take them with you, reminding yourself every day as you always remind yourself to make sure that all your homeworks are done on time and are submitted back. Um, so, and the same thing to those who, whatever that you do daily as a priority, make this a priority as well. I also would ask and beg you to support such an initiative as mine uh, by visiting my website, www.thefrancisbachfoundation.org. Um, it is only one year old <laughs> foundations, and uh, we need a lot of support. I also appeal to anybody that can volunteer um, because I need a lot of volunteers. Being students, anybody, I need a lot of volunteers. Because I stayed in South Sudan a lot, and I don't do much, so I need people that could support me while I'm not here. So that is one thing that I want to appeal to you. But once again, thank you so very much for listening and for your commitment to really be a part of it and be a voice of the voiceless. Good night. <laughs>